So I haven't traveled as much as, as everybody in this room. Uh, there are probably some people in here that have traveled more than I have, uh, but I probably uh, almost died more than most people in this room. Uh, I don't need these lights on, actually. It's probably going to mess up my, my slides here. All right, so I've been to 25 states. These are the states that I've been to. This is uh, not blue because I'm a Democrat. Uh, it's, these are 387 electoral votes, though, just in case you're wondering. This is, this is 25 states plus the District of Columbia, and I did not do the thing where I'm counting airport layovers. That's the next map. So I've done uh, airport layovers over, over here, and I've driven through this part of West Virginia, but I didn't get out of the car to pee. This is the world map that I've been to. This is, this is 25 countries, so I think it's 25. It's uh, US, Canada, Mexico, Cuba, Jamaica, Virgin Islands, not a country, Costa Rica, Peru, Brazil, uh, France, Germany, Netherlands, Denmark, Italy, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, India, China, South Korea, Japan, Thailand, Malaysia, and Singapore. If you count the layovers or the drive-throughs, none of them are drive-throughs, but if you were to count them, you'd get these. This is uh, Puerto Rico, not a country, and, uh, and Taiwan. Okay, there, the, there are the layovers. Okay, so not all of my travel stories are from hell. Some of them uh, are, are very positive. Uh, this one was from this year. There's uh, St. Peter's. This is the Trevi Fountain. That's, that's Rome. Uh, this is Chichen Itza in the rain. Uh, this summer, I also went to, uh, to Kentucky, to Bardstown, Kentucky, which is the home of the Jim Beam Distillery. And if you've seen a Jim Beam ad recently, you'll have noticed that Mila Kunis is the celebrity spokesperson for Jim Beam. And this is her barrel in the Rick House. It's at eye level. It's prime uh, real estate. Um, I've also, uh, had my most successful vacation of all time was Jordan, and this is the Dead Sea. Uh, if you're going to go in the Dead Sea, don't shave any parts of your body within 48 hours of going there because it hurts like hell. Also, uh, don't think that this is some refreshing thing where you can just dunk down and, ah, I'm so refreshed. Uh, because if it gets in your eye, it will sting. You, you'll, you'll practically go blind. It's, it's really painful. Also, don't, don't wipe your lips. That's also painful. <laughs> what do people do when they go to the Dead Sea? They, uh, they slather mud on their bodies and the bodies of their loved ones. <laughs> this can also be kind of painful. So once this dries, it's, uh, it exfoliates your skin, and, uh, and, and it's kind of it's painful. Um, it also, it's also as salty as the, uh, as the salt water. Uh, the Dead Sea, by the way, 10 times saltier than the, uh, than the saltiness of the ocean. 35% salt. Crazy. Okay, so when you're around the Dead Sea and you, go to the, uh, and, you, and you go to the gift shops around the Dead Sea, they sell Dead Sea products that you can also slather uh, on your body. And in one of these, these, these shops around the Dead Sea, uh, I saw the best English translation fail I've ever seen with this uh, beauty product. <laughs> this is uh, olive oil and Dead Sea mud. And the olive oil possesses excellent emollient properties and does not cause any irritation or dryness to the skin, while ass mud tightens, rejuvenates, and purifies the skin. This was nevertheless the best place that, uh, that, that I've ever been. You don't get, as, you don't get nearly as many uh, uh, tourist attractions and beautiful things in such a concentrated area as Jordan. This is, uh, this is the Canyon of the Crescent Moon in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, um, otherwise known as Petra in Jordan. You can go there. Um, I went there. Um, I bought this uh, kufia from a seller uh, on the street, so I'm, I'm sorry if it's cultural appropriation. There are also, uh, I, I, like, I, like movie, I like movies, I like classic movies, I like James Bond and, uh, and, and Star Wars 
and Indiana Jones. And this is a scene from the first like two minutes, maybe the first two seconds of The Man with the Golden Gun. And this is in Thailand. This is a picture taken from James Bond Island. So we're on James Bond Island. It wasn't called James Bond Island before The Man with the Golden Gun came out. But anyway, there's this mushroom-shaped rock that has these solar panels that come out. And The Man with the Golden Gun has this solar device that captures all of that energy and blows shit up with it. And that was, that was his thing. So, uh, so what, what you know, of, what you can tell about this photo, you can't tell much from it, um, because this, this photo must have been taken deep in the jungle because this rock does not look as big, as, nearly as big as it is. It's about 100 yards away from the, uh, from the shore, and, uh, and it takes a lot more effort than you expect it would uh, to swim out there, um, especially if the tour boat's gonna leave without you. The other thing um, is that the base of this uh, mushroom-shaped rock is covered in sharp uh, barnacles and little crabs that, that, that walk around. This is my friend, he went out there first, he's got his GoPro, and when he, uh, he wanted to like give the mushroom-shaped James Bond rock a high five, right, so he's, he slapped it, and it cut his hand on the barnacles, and uh, that's his travel story from, uh, from hell. Okay, so, uh, so got the perfunctory picture, didn't realize this was gonna happen, so the angle is way off here, <laughs> sucks. Also went to, uh, this, this was a, a meeting at the World Haptics Conference in, uh, in Furstenfeld, Brook, uh, uh, Germany. And this is, uh, and this is the, uh, this is an, in an abbey complex, and this is the, uh, the church at the abbey complex. Now, while, uh, while there was a particularly uh, boring talk at the conference, I was flipping through Wikipedia to see what this abbey complex was all about. And it turns out that there were two full body relics, full body relics in the, uh, in the abbey. So, uh, so this, is, this is a 2,000 year old dead guy in the nave of the church. His name is Saint Hyacinth. And there's some controversy whether or not this is, is actually St. Hyacinth, but anyway, he's, he's there. And, uh, and you know, this, this kind of seems like some like, like, like humorless monk thing, but they can't be that humorless because about 100 yards away from, from the front of the church was this sculpture. <laughs> I think he's got to remove a few ribs first. <laughs> Okay, so what, what am I not covering? So, um, so, so those, that's, that's, uh, those are just some things that happened. Those aren't my travel stories from hell yet. Um, but, but, but this slide, travel stories from, from heck. <laughs> Lots of, so I've flown probably 500,000 miles. That's not a lot compared to like a management consultant or like a rock star or something, but it's pretty good for a 34 years old professor. So uh, missed flights and unwanted overnights, that happens quite frequently. I've had them in Dallas, Shanghai, Northern Virginia, um, particularly um, uh, 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 trying circumstances, and many bouts of indigestion. So when you travel, indigestion can be caused by a lot of different things. You can have plain vanilla traveler's diarrhea, like you just drink a lot of the water that you don't treat properly. Uh, and you just kind of have a consistent uh, 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 feeling the whole time, and uh, but then then you if you if you up it a little bit, you can get norovirus, and and you have diarrhea and vomiting uh, for 48 hours straight, uh, and then so I've had these things in India, Malaysia, Brazil, but Las Vegas, uh, and this was from some uh, some some crab legs. Uh, at one of the, the, the buffets, and I took that norovirus with me to the Grand Canyon, which sucked. Now, of course, when, when you're in some of these places that are most prone to give you uh, uh, diarrhea or indigestion in general, um, you're generally not going to find like a Western toilet. You'll probably find one of these suckers. <laughs> and, if you're really lucky, you'll find one of these, but you'll probably only find it in Japan or, or South Korea. Okay, so in 2008, uh, I, I, there was a National Science Foundation uh, sponsor trip. I was a grad student. Um, I, was, uh, I was 25, this is December 2008, and, this, and, and there was a, a National Science Foundation uh, trip 
that got about 10 uh, professors, 10 grad students from uh, America, and about 10 grad students and, uh, and professors from, from India to travel around and talk to people in rural environments about, uh, about scientific solutions to developing world problems. And it was, it, it, it was really cool. I was really glad to be, uh, to be selected uh, for this. Uh, one of the problems with this, this is December 2008. And if you remember back then, uh, this was nine years ago, it late in, uh, um, well, uh, late, in, late in, in, in November of uh, 2008, there was a very bad terrorist attack in Mumbai. Um, and we were scheduled to go about, uh, about three days later after the terrorist attack. And, uh, and we thought that the, the whole trip was going to be canceled. Uh, but it, it didn't end up being canceled. Um, my, and, 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 and to add sort of a, a personal uh, flavor to this, I was also uh, toward the end of grad school and I was getting really stressed out. In fact, I, had, uh, I, I started to get these heart palpitations. I had like a cardiac MRI. Um, I had this really like expensive uh, workup. Of course, I didn't know because my insurance paid for everything. Um, uh, and, and basically what they, what, what they told me, this cardiac electrophysiologist told me um, to uh, stop drinking coffee, which I had done already, um, to, uh, to limit my, uh, my, my alcohol intake and, uh, and to smell the roses. And that was after like literally $10,000 in medical workup and that's what they told me to do. Uh, so then there was a terrorist attack and then we were going to, to India and I'd never, never been um, that far away uh, for quite so long as this trip. So basically we started out, we flew into, uh, into New Delhi, then we took a train to Kanpur to visit IIT Kanpur, uh, one of the premier uh, research universities in India. Then we took a 24 hour, supposed to be 16 hour train ride, but ended up being 24 hour train ride because of some uh, mechanical issues or, 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 or something on the road or something. Uh, and then we ended up uh, about here, uh, about here. In a, in a in a remote uh, a village, the first thing that I noticed was the air pollution in uh, in Delhi. But it wasn't like this every day. Uh, there was rain that night. Then it was a beautiful day the next day, and I got to see Humayun's tomb. Humayun was the uh, was the second uh, uh, Mughal um, uh, emperor in the the Mughal dynasty. And this is uh, not quite as nice as the Taj Mahal, but it's almost as nice as the Taj Mahal. So the, uh, the trip to India was characterized by lots of bus and train trips. So this is the group. This is Professor Sandeep Tiwari, who is a material science and uh, electrical engineer uh, from Cornell. And he was kind of the, 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 un, uh, the, the, the willing but inexperienced uh, tour guide, like, like an, an academic being, uh, being a tour guide. But he was, he was, uh, he, he, he was great with the, with the cards that he was, he was dealt. So we got on this, uh, this train here, and this is my uh, sleeping berth. This is back when uh, digital cameras didn't automatically remove the red eye uh, from virtually every photo. And uh, I basically didn't sleep on this trip at all because we all had such late, uh, late nights and early wake-ups. And this uh, night in particular, I didn't sleep because, uh, because this window uh, behind me, and, and keep in mind, this is uh, a week after the terrorist attack, uh, just at 5 a.m., completely shattered, completely shattered. I can't believe that my, my, my hearing was, was actually not, uh, not damaged by this. And then there's about a nine millimeter hole here in the glass, uh, right at about a uh, head level. And I kind of just, just assumed the worst that people were like shooting at the train. I never ended up, I never figured out what, what actually ended up happening here. Um, when I told Sandeep about this, he said it was probably a cricket ball. Some kid just hit a cricket ball at 5 a.m. into the train. <laughs> and then uh, that night we got to the hotel at about uh, 1 a.m. with a 4.30 a.m. Uh, wake-up call. And, uh, and when I saw that this gecko was running around the, uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the room, I just said, fuck it. <laughs> okay. This is, uh, this is Cuba. Not too many Americans have been to Cuba. Uh, the, this was also a scientific trip. Uh, this was the, a combination of the American Chemical Society and the, uh, and the, the, the uh, Cuban Chemical Society. We're having this, this, uh, uh, this, this Pan-American Chemical uh, Society meeting in Havana. 
So this was before the thawing of relations with Cuba from the, uh, from the Obama administration. Um, and uh, so this was going to go down regardless of what, of what was going to happen um, uh, diplomatically, uh, because there are certain types of visas that you can get that make it more or less uh, OK uh, to, to go there. So, uh, so I thought, well, this is, uh, that could be kind of scary. Like, not many Americans go there. If you go to Cuba, they assume that you're Canadian. Uh, the Canadians, incidentally, don't like that more Americans are going there because uh, prices are going up and, and, and so on. Uh, so, so I did a lot of preparation for this trip. So I got the, uh, the Rosetta Stone uh, Spanish um, uh, uh, program um, 10 months before, uh, before going there. Um, believe, believe it or not, uh, I, I, I actually spent probably 200 or 300 hours like, on that program trying to... Uh, Trying to learn uh, to learn Spanish in case the shit hit the fan somehow, um, and 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 I kind of converted uh, converted my entertainment uh, to Spanish as well, and uh, and I was I was really I was really taking this seriously. Like I was really taking this trip seriously. I was going to have a good experience, uh, and uh, and what they told me uh, was that your American credit cards aren't going to work. They're not going to take your American money, and the, you're not going to be able to access your American bank account. So I just said, this is the 21st century. I can do whatever I want, <laughs> right? I can, I, can, I can bring 200 US dollars and all my American credit cards and ATM cards, and they'll be fine. It'll be totally fine. Uh, and, uh, and, and why wouldn't it be? I mean, this is, this is a beautiful, modern uh, hotel room. It's, uh, you know, this is the view. The other side of the hotel had the ocean view. That was better. Um, they even had gin and tonic carts. So, this is, this, so you order a gin and tonic at this restaurant, and they bring this whole cart over. And they're like four kinds of tonic and like, like six kinds of gin. I thought that was really cool. We went out toward the end. I was being very careful about spending my money. So the... Uh, the internet cost money per minute, and you had to go to the front desk and you had to pay them um, in cash. They actually did take my American money somehow, uh, so that that was good. Uh, and, and I had to pay per minute. So I'm watching the the, the counter uh, tick tick down, and I and I get on Chase.com, and I'm like, I'm just just gonna transfer some money. I'm just gonna wire some money over to a friend that they can. They can give me some money or something. I don't know what I was going to do. And Chase, uh, unable to reach, uh, to reach your, your, your from an IP address uh, that you can't access this website or, or whatever. So I couldn't, I couldn't get the money, um, but that was fine. I had enough. I had, I, had, uh, I had budgeted so that if I ordered the cheapest thing on the menu and ate the, all the granola bars that I brought, I'd, I'd be OK. <laughs> So then we went out uh, on the last night to, uh, to, an old, uh, to old Havana. And there are this beautiful Spanish colonial architecture. There are more feral cats than I've ever seen in my life. All of these little lumps, are, these are all cats. There are probably 30 of them in this, uh, in this field of view. And, uh, and we went, we went, the food there is, is delicious. The conference food was complete shit, but the food that, that we had, uh, the food that we had at the, um, at the, the restaurants, that was awesome. Uh, so we went out to this restaurant. It was kind of like a, like a house that someone had converted to a restaurant. And, uh, and it was all the people in my field. So this is an organic photovoltaic, so plastic solar cells conference. And all the people in my field were there. Everyone wanted to go to Cuba. So all the people who were going to write me like letters for tenure or could have been asked to write me letters for tenure and promotions, they were all there. And you always picture as a young academic that all of your older professor colleagues are just are judging you constantly. So um, there is sound here, but I don't, I don't really, uh, I hope it doesn't. It, okay, it doesn't need to. It doesn't need to play. That's that's fine. So there's some Cuban music playing here, and 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 you'll just have to trust me that these people are super famous in the organic photovoltaics field, and there are like eight eight of them that are really famous here. Like exactly the people who would write to, who would write the, the the tenure letters, and everyone's having a good time, and uh, and and I and I ordered. Um, basically, the, I ordered the cheapest thing on the menu, and I didn't order a drink. Uh, and I basically ordered like like a chicken wing. 
and, and water. Uh, and, uh, and everyone else, they, they didn't order a chicken wing and water. They ordered whatever they wanted. And they ordered what must have been the most expensive wine uh, on the menu. And every single person ordered a whole bottle of wine for them. And I'm like, oh, that's OK. You can spend $500 on this meal. I don't need to. Uh, but then my colleague, uh, uh, Mark Thompson, from University of Southern California, who did a lot of the work to bring organic LED technologies into, uh, into existence, which is basically uh, you go to Best Buy and they're all like organic LED TVs. He did a lot of basic scientific work there. He's sitting right next to me. The, the bill came and I, and I was about to take the, you know, the $20 bill, because I had like $40 left, uh, and put it on the table and put it in the, in the bill. And he said, well, you can imagine what happened. He said, so uh, we're just going to split this evenly. <laughs> and uh, so I, I took all the money that I had, and I just put it on the table. And I said, it's, and I said to myself, like, that's totally not enough. But I have no money left. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and there's supposedly some exit ta tax that you have to pay the customs official on the way out of the airport. Um, and uh, so I had, to, I had to borrow money from a, from, from, from a young uh, colleague who happened to have brought like $3,000 or something. And, uh, and, and, and that, that had a happy ending um, eventually. Although I would have enjoyed it more had I brought like $600 and I actually could have, you know, drank and stuff. Anyway, OK, so at this, uh, at this place, it wasn't all bad. You know, they had this uh, painting, which I thought was really cool. And uh, there, was a lot, there were a lot of freebies, too. Uh, so you go to the Caribbean, and, uh, and this, is, this is free rum, and this is the smallest cigar anybody's ever seen. But it was free. OK. All right. Strap in for the next one. My wife is a big fan of Tintin, the Tintin comics. He's French, I guess. Is he French? Tintin? He's, he's Belgian. Okay. Here's Tintin. He's, uh, so my, my wife had this book, this comic book, uh, as a kid growing up. And she, this is one of the ones that she read like 200 times. We all have those like Richard Scarry books and Where's Waldo? And we've seen every page every time and they all, they're all covered in food and everything. <laughs> this, this was her book. And she wanted, since she was five years old or thereabouts, to go to where they were. Uh, which, is, uh, which is the Peruvian Andes in the era of the Inca. This is uh, Peru. This is Peru. Here's Lima. It's one of the largest cities in the Americas. Uh, things to know about Peru. What's to know about Peru? Because it's close, so close to the equator, we have this impression that it's kind of small. But actually, Peru is quite large. If this is New Orleans down here, this up here would be the border of, of Montana and Canada. So Peru is, is quite, quite vast. Also, the Peruvian, uh, uh, the, the Andes region is also where uh, staples of Western food, even uh, like, um, like, uh, like corn or uh, tomatoes and potatoes, all that stuff is from this, this region of South America. OK, so here is Lima. It takes a flight to fly over the, uh, the Andes to get to Cuzco, which is a, uh, which is a city that people uh, use as a staging ground for hiking to Machu Picchu. And Machu Picchu is the centerpiece of Peruvian tourism. Now, the, this is a high mountain. But it's not quite, it's not really that high. It's like 1,000 feet, it's like 1,300 feet higher than like Boulder, Colorado. It's like 7,900 feet or so. And I'm sure I got the arithmetic wrong there. But anyway, there it is. About 7,900 feet. Now around you though, are peaks that are, you know, like 14,000 up to 20,000 uh, 20, feet. So when you hike the Inca Trail, it has, it follows a, uh, it follows a grade like this. So you can do this hike. Uh, typically, what you do is you hire a company and you travel with porters who carry all, all your stuff. And you, uh, you spend the first night here. Then you go up to this. This is actually a saddle point. So the mountains actually come in and out of the plane of the screen. And this mountain pass is called, the, uh, is called Dead Woman's Pass. 
because if you do a Google search for this, you can try to convince yourself that the rock formations off in the distance look like a dead woman. I never saw it. Speaking of where's Waldo, but, uh, but there it is. Uh, and uh, so you end up going to about 14,000 feet and then back down. Now, why does it matter? Who cares? Like, uh, like Vail, Breckenridge, they're all 14. But, you know, you go to Pikes Peak, 14,000 feet, whatever. Uh, Mount Whitney, 14,000 feet in California, not even that far away from here. It is not a problem for most people. This is my uh, SNP genotype. <laughs> This is, uh, the SNP is the single nucleotide polymorphism genotype, and it is the locations on your DNA that make you different from, every, from all the other humans. Now, there are some single nucleotide polymorphisms that are associated with certain genetic diseases, like this one. So sickle cell disease, sickle cell anemia, is a really, uh, a really horrifying uh, disease. It is, uh, it's a disease where you have, uh, so I'm a professor, I'm going to profess for a second. You, you get a hydrophobic patch on the, on the ends of your hemoglobin molecules, and as a result, they tend to stick together. So they stick together, they get all gummy, and they turn your normal red blood cells into, sickle, into a sickle, a rigid sickle shape that impact on each other and clog your blood vessels. So as a result, people that have sickle cell disease uh, end, up, end up having uh, what's called an autosplenectomy, where the cells impact in their bl small blood vessels in their, in their spleens so early that they lose complete spleen function um, very early in their life after a few, a few years. Until recently, people with sickle cell anemia um, didn't, didn't live very long. Um, it's a really, a really horrific disease. Now, if this is a genetic disease, why did it persist in the gene pool? It persisted in the gene pool in equatorial and mid-latitude, lower mid-latitude uh, regions because of uh, the prevalence of malaria in those, in those regions. Now, if you have one bad copy of the sickle cell gene, it turns out that the blood cells are a lot easier to be, uh, to be removed by your body, the blood cells that are infected by the, uh, by the malaria parasite. And therefore, you have an advantage if you have one copy of the sickle cell gene. And this is one of those things that, uh, that they tell you in, in school, like, like having the sickle cell trait is, is good. Like it's good. There's no downside to it. You're, just, you're 10 times, uh, you're half as likely to contract malaria and 10 times less likely to die from it if you actually get it. Sounds like a good deal to me, actually. Uh, and so, uh, so what they don't tell you here is that the sickle cell trait actually manifests at high altitudes. This is the, uh, the new mile, well, it's not so new anymore, but this is the current uh, Mile High Stadium in Denver. And so we were going to go, my wife and I were going to go on this trip to Peru. We had been planning it for a while. And, uh, and right, right, um, right before we planned the trip, we did this thing called 23andMe, which is, which is this, which is where you spit in a, in, a, in a tube and you send it to the company and they do your SNP genotype for you. And they send you this genetic analysis and this, um, this uh, uh, ancestry analysis. They can't tell you too much about diseases now because the FDA cracked down on them for, for, for giving like medical advice when they, they didn't have, uh, they, they weren't allowed to. Um, but I, I got grandfathered in because I, I submitted my spit in the tube before the FDA cracked down on them. So I still have all of my, my disease risk factors. And I found out that I had the sickle cell trait. Um, I, uh, anyway, okay. So right around, so I, I found out about that. We hadn't booked our ticket yet. And at the, around the same time, uh, one of the players for the, uh, for the Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, Ryan Clark, had a high altitude splenic infarct and he had to have a spleen removed uh, from a playoff game or because uh, he, he had played a game in Denver, uh, exerted himself in the normal way that a professional athlete does, but at high altitude with the sickle cell trait. And, uh, and 
An estimated, this is a story from NPR at around the time, an estimated 2.5 million people share Clark's condition. Uh, the NIH says that the majority of them lead normal lives until situations like those experienced by Clark pop up. They just pop up. It's no big deal. Uh, since then, Ryan Clark has actually founded a, uh, a, a, uh, a research um, a foundation dedicated to sickle cell anemia, uh, not necessarily sickle cell trait, but full-blown sickle cell anemia, which is obviously much more severe. But anyway, we, we said 2.5 million Americans. 2.5 million Americans, that's like two-thirds of a percent. That's like, round up, that's like 1% of Americans have the sickle cell trait. If this were so dangerous, you would have to take a blood test before getting on a plane to a ski resort. You would have to take a blood test at the entrance to Sequoia National Park so, so that if you said, oh, I have, I'm gonna go up to Mount Whitney, they say, yeah, like hell you are. If this were so dangerous, this is the only thing you would ever hear about. They depressurize planes to like the equivalent of 8,000 feet, and I've flown half a million miles in my life and never had a problem. So we figured this must be really, really, really vanishingly uncommon. And I'm a scientist, so I looked at the med medical literature, and indeed, only 42 cases of high altitude splenic infarct had ever been reported in the medical literature. So we bought our tickets to, uh, to Peru. And this is a typical Peruvian meal, just kidding. But this is, this is typical of what you might find uh, at a bar. Uh, Inca Cola, zero. <laughs> so we spent some time in Lima, went up to, uh, went up to Cusco. Cusco is at about 11,500 feet or so. Um, it's, a, it's kind of like an, like an ancient seat of the, of the Inca culture. It's a really beautiful city. If you, if you go to Peru, you should, definitely, uh, you should definitely go there. Now, I started to develop a, a pain in my side. And uh, after a, a few days, um, uh, we're acclimating to the climate, and I'm taking the, the altitude sickness meds, uh, acetazolamide, which is not really designed for people with sickle cell trait, but it's designed just for like fainting and stuff. First night that I got to Cusco, my spleen started to hurt, and I fainted for the first time in my life. I'd never fainted before. Um, uh, yeah, never, never fainted before. Uh, and, and, uh, and I thought, well, that's, that's right where the, 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 the colon kind of wraps around the spleen. And, uh, and, but maybe it's just because of all that alpaca meat that I ate. <laughs> it tastes like beef, by the way. And I wouldn't recommend um, eating it because I already told you it tastes like beef, so you don't need to eat those poor alpacas. Okay. Anyway, let the, alpa let the alpacas live. So anyway, I started to get this pain. I really started to get this pain here. Here's a, here's a, a selfie. This is uh, Olante Tambo, uh, which is a, 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 an ancient uh, Inca, Incan ruins uh, there. And this is the last night before we got on the Inca Trail. And I'm like, I really shouldn't be doing this. This is like, not the worst pain I've ever had, although that was to come. <laughs> but it's pain that I didn't want to do uh, two, two to 5,000 miles of hiking ascents in one, uh, in one day. Uh, what, uh, what, what, was, what was great about, about, uh, about Peru and the Andes is the natural beauty. Of course, we, the, the cultural aspects are fantastic. The natural beauty is fantastic. The Andes are like Sequoia or Yosemite with the grandness of the mountains multiplied by a factor of 10, and the, or multiplied by a factor of maybe two, and the biodiversity uh, multiplied by like a factor of 10. It's really, uh, really a spectacular place. This is the view outside of my tent on day two, uh, uh, right after um, uh, Dead Woman's Pass. Um, this picture does not uh, not reflect the, uh, the the pain, which was which was horrible. Uh, literally the worst pain that I have ever experienced until a few slides later. It felt like like a serrated knife gouged in between my ribs and twisted, and the dagger is made of a lemon flavored ice cube <laughs> and uh, and I told the tour guide, and I couldn't sleep through any of this, 
And I told the tour guide, I said, I think I have a real problem. I think this is serious. And he's like, it's just indigestion. <laughs> and, and, I, and I convinced myself. I knew what it was. I, I, I knew what it was. But I had convinced myself as a matter of survival that it was just indigestion. Uh, so uh, it didn't really hurt that bad if I didn't breathe or eat or lie down. So I lost 10 pounds over the course of three days. I don't have 10 pounds to lose, but I lost them. And eventually, uh, we went down to Machu Picchu. And that's, that's beautiful. That's a photo everyone that, that goes there ought to get. Um, uh, and I'm really, really sick in this photo. But starting to feel better because Machu Picchu is only like 1, 1,300 feet higher than Boulder, Colorado. It's really the Cusco and the ascent up and then before you go down is where the altitude really, uh, really gets bad. So, uh, so incidentally, when you go to Machu Picchu and you've done the three-day hike uh, and you get up there and then you know, you know all the people on your hike. You've, sometimes you pass other tour groups and they pass you and, you and you stay at the same campsites. But then you get there and there are like 10,000 people there. Like how did they get there? And then there's a parking lot. And, and, <laughs> and some buses. Anyway, it's, it's, it's really hard to swallow. So we took the bus down, then we took the bus uh, back up to uh, Cusco City again. Again, Cusco is very beautiful. At this point though, my spleen started to feel a little bit better. So I'm like, I'm not gonna take the acetazolamide, which is the high altitude med anymore, uh, because I, because I kind of feel, feel fine. Uh, but that was a huge mistake. I don't know what it was doing, this is an off-label use, but whatever it was doing, it was doing something to my blood chemistry to prevent those hemoglobin molecules from sticking together and infarcting my spleen. So when I stopped taking it and we just went back up and up and up and up to Cusco and, and literally like the pain in my spleen was almost like an altimeter. And we got to the top and I had, if it was a 10 before, the pain was then a, a 12, solid 12. And we had to cancel the rest of the trip. We were supposed to go further into, the, into, uh, into Peru, into the, uh, the Peruvian jungle, uh, but we figured that it was probably better to get back, to, uh, back to, to sea level sooner rather than later. Uh, and it was, it, was, it, was pretty, it was pretty harrowing, I'm not gonna lie, I almost died. Like, I, I thought, like, I, I, if I, you know how, how they say, like, breathing, the minute you know that breathing is autonomous and you can picture yourself breathing, you're like, no, I can control my breathing, that's fine. Uh, but imagine being in a situation where if you don't think about breathing, you stop breathing. And, and you stop breathing and you have no energy to continue breathing. Like, each breath was, was a struggle. So, uh, so my wife rearranged all of our travel to go back to Lima, uh, back to sea level. And I was trying not to fall asleep. I was dead tired because I didn't sleep at all on the Inca Trail. I was dead tired. I couldn't, uh, I had to think about every breath and I couldn't fall asleep because I was afraid if I fell asleep, I wouldn't have enough energy to breathe. So somehow putting one foot in front of the other, I made, it to the, I made it to the airport the next morning. I just basically just sat there for like, for like at night for like eight hours until, until the time came to take a cab to the, uh, to the airport. And as we're taking off in Cusco, which is already at 11,500 feet, my ears are popping. I'm like, no, you're depressurizing a plane that already took off at 11,500 feet. So anyway, I just willed whatever blood cells that I had not to sickle any more than they did. And then we landed in, uh, in Lima. Lima is beautiful. And I, the, first, the first night in Lima, it took, a, it took a very long time to feel any effect. Well, it took like 24 hours before I started to feel any resolution whatsoever. Uh, and how I had to sleep, for example, that night, because I basically, there was only one position, infinitesimally in any direction uh, was caused excruciating pain, like screaming level pain. And so what I did to sleep that night was I stacked up all the phone books in, in our hotel room and from the front desk. And then I slept on the bed like this on the phone books 
uh, so that um, just basically like a uh, like a um, like an airline tray table kind of thing, uh, and in, in finding that position just was just felt so good. So the next morning, after like after after breathing the um, after breathing the like smog smog in Lima never smelled so good because it was because it had the correct oxygen partial pressure. <laughs> And so as a, uh, so, so then the next day, like my, my wife is downstairs trying to work out the rest of our travel plans, trying to get an earlier flight back. And we were just uh, postdocs at the time and we didn't have money to buy like an international ticket the day of. Uh, so, uh, so, what, uh, so what we did was we said, well, we're just gonna go to the emergency room in Lima and get medical treatment there. And when you get uh, medical treatment in Peru, it's basically like a Starbucks. And I imagine this is probably how it is in most countries other than the United States, which does things in a completely asinine way. You see the doctor. The doctor listens to you talk. Then they prescribe some tests. You do the tests. The doctor reviews the tests. He tells you, or he or she tells you what they think you have and uh, writes a prescription. Um, and then you swipe your credit card, and you're done. Uh, so he he said you're okay to travel, you're okay to travel. So uh, so so that that felt good. I had gone from a from a from a 15 pain down to like an eight uh, over the course of breathing overnight at uh, at at sea level. So he went to Lima. Um, this is a common theme, actually a common theme of, of this trip and the next one, which is the last one, uh, uh, of going out into the hinterland of a company, or con company, country, and then coming back to the capital city to spend some unexpected days exploring the culture when you actually did the trip to be like an eco-culture tourist. So this is the Cathedral of Lima. Uh, in the basement, there are some skulls, which is, uh, Pretty creepy. Also, the uh, the tomb of Francisco Pizarro, the uh, the Spanish conquistador, is also um, in the Cathedral of Lima. But it's not so creepy as what's in the basement of this place. This is the San Francisco Monastery, which uh, which in its catacombs has the the skeletal remains of twenty five thousand people. And when I got back, which I never would have seen had I not almost died. <laughs> now, when I got back from, uh, from Peru, I had uh, an extensive workup from my, uh, my doctor in Palo Alto, and that's right before I came to UCSD. Then I saw a hematologist at UCSD, and the hematologist, you know, blood doctor, blood specialist said, even if this, what you had is so rare, that even if I knew you had the sickle cell trait, I wouldn't have advised you not to go to, uh, to Peru. So that validated me uh, slightly. And, and foxsports.com validated me slightly. <laughs> Just an anomaly. Doesn't, doesn't matter. Even though 9% of uh, football players are, are uh, believed to, to carry the, uh, the sickle cell trait, um, uh, it's, it's just, just, he's the unlucky one, just, a, just an anomaly. You can walk around with them your whole life and not know they're there. And then there's this one unlucky person out walking the dog who falls over. We can't tell in advance which person the sickle cell trait is more likely to be symptomatic than others. And on the very last day in Lima, we got to visit the erotic pottery museum. You can't unsee it. <laughs> so my wife got to go to her dream vacation location. <laughs> vacation lo location, whatever. And then I wanted to go to mine. And, and why would this be mine? This, you might ask, what is he? This is a proboscis monkey uh, in the mangroves of Borneo. Now, uh, we had this VHS tape at my local library where my mom worked uh, as I grew up. And because we had some number of tapes, 
uh, she would bring them home to me and I would watch them a million times each. And we had this National Geographic one from 1986 called Creatures of the Mangrove. And it starred these proboscis monkeys. And I thought, Borneo, what's Borneo? That sounds cool. So I researched as a six-year-old everything I could find out about Borneo. This is Borneo. Borneo is the third largest non-continental island in the world after Greenland and New Guinea. Uh, Borneo bears parts of two countries, so about three quarters of it is the Indonesian state of Kalimantan, and the upper portion, the northern portion, is, uh, is the Malaysian states of Sarawak here, Sabah here, and the independent nation of uh, Brunei uh, here. Here is, uh, here's Malaysia uh, in the context of uh, Eastern Malaysia or Bornean Malaysia here and Peninsular Malaysia here, just to calibrate you. Here's Singapore down here. Kuala Lumpur is here. That's the capital of, um, of Malaysia. East Malaysia, the Bornean Malaysia, is quite remote compared to West Malaysia. Our flight uh, went from Hong Kong, which is somewhere up here, down to uh, Kota Kinabalu, then down to Kuching. Kuching is the largest city in East Malaysia, still not very big, but it's the largest city in East Malaysia. It may actually be the largest city in Borneo. So uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is Kuching. Does anybody watch um, Parts Unknown with Anthony Bourdain? He also had a No Reservations episode on uh, Malaysian Borneo, uh, both of them actually separated by 10 years, really worth watching. Actually, we went to pretty much exactly the same places that he went to, um, uh, and we were almost as adventurous in what we ate uh, as he was. Okay, so there's, it's, it's a, a beautiful uh, Southeast Asian uh, town, uh, beautiful architecture, uh, rivers, um, but then there's some signs where, uh, where maybe things are not quite as, um, safe and happy as you think they are. <laughs> so signs like this, you know, they were, they were in a few places. That's, that's okay. Uh, but, uh, and then, then um, okay. So we got there like uh, the, the night before. We slept, we spent all day in Kuching. We bought some artwork. We explored the, the city. It, the, we had awesome food. It was, it was great. We saw this sign, that was a little weird. Uh, we met up with our tour group, and our tour group uh, consisted of, uh, of about 15 or so people plus the tour guide. On our way to, our, to the restaurant, uh, we were walking, uh, I, heard a, uh, I heard a scream, and, uh, and I saw our tour guide run after a guy in a mo motorcycle who had, who had grabbed one of our, uh, our travel mate's purses and he didn't get a good grip on it, and he accidentally dropped it uh, on the ground. And our tour guide, who is Malaysian, said, I have never seen that. I've been doing this a long time. I have never seen that in my life. Most of the tour group went out uh, for drinks, um, but we had a long night the night uh, before from traveling. So we, uh, my wife and I, and actually the, uh, the woman who had her, her purse grabbed uh, also uh, came out or was going back to the hotel with us. So we were walking maybe like three side to side and I, I don't know, I was like looking at some gum on the ground and, and I heard our, our travel companion like shout, like, like shout. I don't remember what she said. It was a blur. When I looked up, a guy on a motorcycle had my wife's purse and was with my wife attached to it and dragged her into traffic about 10 yards from exactly where this sign was during the day into this traffic here. Now, mind you, she, it wasn't hooked to her arm. It wasn't stuck there. She had grabbed onto it and wanted to pull <laughs> that motherfucker off <laughs> the motorcycle and gouge his fucking eyes out. She lasted about 50 yards wearing a 
tank top, skirt, flip-flops, dragged on asphalt like 50 yards. I kicked off my flip-flops and ran toward them as, far, as fast as I could and just shouted, let go, and eventually she did. Uh, I won't go into the details about how, uh, how, how horrific and disgusting the, uh, the injuries were. They were really quite bad. We thought she had a broken, uh, a broken arm. She had lacerations and, uh, and abrasions on both palms, both elbows, both shoulders, both knees, uh, both shins. In the purse was her money, not a big deal, phone, not a big deal, but her passport as well. And this is somebody who's actually quite travel savvy, more so than I am, but we had such a, she, she, she grew up in many different countries overseas, um, and, but on this one day, because it felt so safe during the day, uh, they got everything. And you can't even travel in East Malaysia, so Bornean Malaysia, you can't even travel there between the states without your visa stamp in your passport. So thankfully, you know, one of the things that we did right was we took photocopies of our passport and put, it, put them everywhere because you want, to, you want to, uh, to, to diversify your risk, right, when you travel. <laughs> so you put them everywhere. Uh, and and uh, we had, there was, the, the trip was about two weeks uh, long, was scheduled to be about two weeks long. This happened on the first night. There were trips to, uh, to the rainforest and to, uh, to the largest cave systems in the world. There was a snorkeling trip that was, that was supposed to happen. Um, we did do some of that, and I'll show you uh, what we did see, because we were going on these trips while also on the phone with our insurance companies and, uh, and airlines and hotels. Um, and the U.S. Uh, embassy in Kuala Lumpur that eventually we had to go back to and abandon the rest of, of the trip. Much like, uh, much like we had to go back to, to, uh, to Lima, we had to go back to, uh, to Kuala Lumpur. We did see an orangutan in almost the wild. We spent the night at an, at, uh, at an, at an Iban uh, longhouse. This was very early in the morning, but they, like, they party hard, so all the families out here, they dance and all the kids do like backflips and stuff along this really long uh, corridor. That was really uh, uh, a, a fantastic uh, cultural experience. Did some boating in uh, rivers in the rainforest. We saw the largest, uh, some of the largest bat migrations in the world. So there's a cave down here, and you see what looks like smoke here. This isn't smoke. These are hundreds of thousands of bats. And if there's a, like, a, like a stadium seating area where you can wait there, and every five minutes or so at dusk, these bats will just, will just come out, and then they'll eat all of the mosquitoes and the bugs in the rainforest at night, and then they'll go back in the cave and, uh, and sleep during the day. And when you go in those caves, there are like, 20 meters of guano and cake and and uh, that's bad shit and um, and like steps carved into it so you can you can navigate around. So while we did not go to the rainforest uh, in Peru, we did go to the oldest rainforest in the world in uh, in Borneo. And then in our unexpected trip back to Kuala Lumpur, we saw the Petronas Towers. They were cool and uh, so one of the tallest skyscrapers in the world. And in the, the, the bottom five or so floors of the, Kuala, uh, the, the Petronas Towers, what do you put there? But like the fanciest mall we've ever seen uh, in our lives. Okay, well, I didn't really end on a, on a, on a happy note, uh, but there was an orangutan involved. So what are the take home messages? Uh, fly, fly one airline and fly like royalty. So just pick one airline and get your status up as high as possible because when, when, when the shit hits the fan, and it will, um, they'll give you distressed passenger rates on your, uh, on your hotels. Uh, take more cash than you think you'll need. Photocopy your passport and leave the original in the hotel safe. Get your vaccinations a month ahead of time. Stay together. Know your limits. And... The world is a beautiful place. Don't let any of this deter you from traveling. 
If you want uh, to see more uh, stories, I guarantee those are the best stories I've ever told. So you don't expect to find any significantly better, but there are some more stories on my YouTube channel. that are also like professional seminars and courses and stuff. So thank you very much for your, uh, your kind attention.